Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, uh, we've got another video talking about what's going on on the Sullivans. So first off, we're not associated with the Buffalo and Erie Maritime and Naval Park. Um, we have not had the chance to go up there and visit them yet, so um, we don't know their exact setup. And this is an evolving situation, so some of the information we have right now uh, may not be complete compared to what we'll have in a couple of weeks. So take that all with a grain of salt. If you want to hear it from the horse's mouth, they have a YouTube channel as well. We link that in the description. They're posting updates on this uh, incident pretty frequently, so be sure to check those out. So, um, many, many, many people are angry about what happened. Uh, and many of the questions that I've gotten um, revolve around, like, how could this have been allowed to happen? And um, honestly, a lot of the anger and a lot of the, the questions I'm getting um, are along the lines of how was this not run like an active ship and uh, like they're fundamentally making assumptions about how museum ships run that are not accurate uh, and so they're angry that xyz wasn't done when museum ships just can't do that so uh first question how was the inside of their ship able to deteriorate like that Ships don't rust from the outside in, they rust from the inside out. How was that allowed to happen on the Sullivans? Well, we are in the bilge in number one fire room, and you can see just a ton of pack rust down here on the deck. It is not a restored space. Museum ships cannot afford to maintain the whole ship. We maintain our tour routes, uh, and many of us have very beautiful tour routes and ugly bilges. Uh, so USS the Sullivan's probably has a well-restored tour route and uh, bilges that look like ours. Maybe worse, we've only been a museum ship since 2001, and they've been a museum ship much, much longer than that. So even more time to deteriorate. We just don't have the resources to dedicate to off the tour route spaces. The only people who come down here are the folks doing our quarterly bilge inspections. Uh, so why would we spend, uh, it cost about a half a million dollars to restore fire room two. So wh why would we spend that on a space that people aren't seeing? How would we afford to do it? Uh, why would we do it when there's already an engine room restored and a fire room? So this is just duplicate to all that. The next question is, well, money's the problem. Why isn't the federal government giving them money? Museum ships are not run by the Navy. With the exception of Nautilus and Constitution, there are no museum ships that are affiliated with the Navy, that are uh, getting federal funding, anything like that. The Navy has enough trouble maintaining their own ships. They can't afford any money to help restore museum ships. So. Funding is definitely an issue, but it's not like we're getting a ton of money from the federal government and we're spending it on our own paychecks and not on these ships. In a normal museum, half of the museum's revenue goes into uh, employee paychecks and half goes into the collection. On a museum ship, half goes into the preservation of the ship, only a quarter goes into paychecks. So. It's not that we're getting all this federal money from the Navy and not spending it right. I highly recommend that you look up the I-990 forms that various museum ships um, have to post. If you Google uh, Buffalo and Erie, the whole name of their organization, and then I-990, the first thing that comes up is a link to their form. And on their form, it shows you uh, the top salaries of some of their employees. And you can see how much money they were making. The most recent I-990 that's up there right now for museum ships is from uh, 2020. So, you know, adjusted for inflation, those numbers have almost certainly gone up over the years, but it's not like uh, their CEO is raking in six figures. Uh, and you'll see that 
only their CEO's salary is listed, that's because none of their other staff make a substantial enough salary to be on there. Uh, and I recommend you do this for any nonprofit you're thinking of donating to. Look them up, see what their staff is uh, paid and uh, where they're spending that money uh, before you donate. So for full disclosure, there's a link in the description below to our most recent 990. And you can look that up and see what uh, our senior staff get paid and um, decide if you think it's worth putting that money into the museum as a donation or uh, if you think we're spending it all on salaries. The most recent edition of Sea History magazine uh, started off with an article about the Sullivans and uh, honestly, I couldn't follow the thread of the article. I was talking about how museum ships need more money and help and whatnot and was mostly supportive. But then the last paragraph was about uh, looking up 990s and it's all the fault of uh, museum ships for paying their staffs. Uh, and we thought about posting a copy of the article, but that is something that you're supposed to pay for to get a copy of uh, Sea History. So we're, we're not going to throw it up there. I, I encourage you to uh, go out and get a copy of Sea History and uh, we'll flash on the screen what edition it is because I can't remember off the top of my head so you know which one to look up. But be interested in hearing your thoughts after you've read that article uh, on whether it's actually supporting museum ships or not. Uh, but it does show the anger that uh, people have over this happening. Obviously a museum ship sinking is not supposed to happen. Um, so that's where a lot of this anger is coming from. But it, again, it's directed in the wrong place. None of us are working in museums because we're going to get rich on our six-figure salaries. <laughs> uh, we're, we're here because we love it. We're doing the best job we can, short-staffed and uh, significantly shorter staffed than what one of these ships would have in active service back when they were young. So uh, let's go through some more of these questions. That th These are all things that you guys have sent to me over the last couple of weeks. Uh, so again, this is my opinions. I'm going to be largely talking about how Battleship New Jersey operates. So that, because um, like I said, we haven't actually been up to Buffalo. I don't know 100% how they operate, but why the things you're suggesting would not work on New Jersey, why it wouldn't uh, prevent this from happening on us. Uh, so the first question is how was this allowed to happen? Uh, ships don't flood like that. It wasn't a catastrophic wrecking event like where, where the ship ran over a reef and ripped its whole bottom out and sank immediately with all hands. It happened slowly over many hours. So how was this allowed to happen? It happened overnight. We are museums, we're not active ships. We don't have a bridge watch and an in-port repair party uh, on station. At the end of the day, when we turn off the lights, everybody goes home. That there isn't anyone here overnight. If something goes wrong, there is a uh, bilge alarm system that most museum ships have. Uh, so this is one of our bilge pumps right here. It's in the low spot of number one engine room. We've got these all over the ship and we do quarterly uh, tests. So this is the uh, float here where if you pull that, it sounds an alarm throughout the ship. Um, so that we can just test it, pull up the float and see. It also uh, goes to an auto dialer that'll get our nearest, uh, our on-duty security guard or our, uh, in some cases at the previous ships where I worked, there wasn't an overnight security guard in the booth off the ship. There was a, uh, it went to an auto dialer that I got on my cell phone uh, and that went to several staff members just to make sure they woke up. Um, so nobody is on site overnight. If this happens overnight, it could happen to any museum ship that they end up sunk. Uh, when, when I worked on Taney, we had a toilet overflow on second deck. And uh, that toilet kept running and running and running. It filled the holding tank, and then the holding tank uh, backed up and flooded the ship. So we just came in in the morning and found it like that. Something very similar happened here on the Sullivans. Because 
the flooding on Taney happened on second deck and not down in the bilges on fourth deck, it didn't hit any of the float tests to sound the phone to call us, um, which is me telling the story in a much truncated way. But things didn't happen the way they were planned. Staff came in in the morning and dealt with the problem then, which seems to be what happened with the Sullivans. Now, for those of you who don't know, there was a major power outage in Buffalo uh, that stopped the pumps from running in spaces where there were known leaks. And because the pump stopped running, the water was able to build up and spread throughout the ship. Uh, so staff didn't necessarily know that the power was out. And when the power was out, that might have affected the auto dialer or uh, the bilge alarms, things like that. Now, many museum ships also have battery-powered alarms in the bilges, which make a, a very loud, audible noise. Uh, so that you know that something is in there, even if you don't have power and the pump isn't going off and sounding the main ship's alarm, which needs power. The problem is if nobody is there to hear it, that alarm can squeal and squeal and squeal until its battery is dead, but it can't do anything more than that. Uh, the next question is very similar to that one. Why didn't they take action sooner? Well, as soon as staff arrived on scene, they immediately started taking action. Like, again, there aren't people on the ship all night on watch with the skills to deal with these problems. The other thing to consider here is we're tied up to the pier. Uh, the, the ship is an important artifact, but it's not worth more than somebody's life. So if the ship is in danger of sinking, burning, whatever, uh, we don't run onto a sinking ship. We wait for the Coast Guard or the first responders to come and deal with the problem. We are not active military personnel on an active ship. This is a museum that happens to be on a ship, and we are museum professionals. Uh, many of us, like myself, do not have military experience. Why didn't they call for help as soon as the water started coming in? You know, that falls under what we've been saying before. They, they called for help as soon as somebody was there to assess the problem. Uh, and I have to say, they did a significantly better job calling for help than many other museum ships that have had water intrusion issues. Uh, they, they got contractors out, they got the Coast Guard out, law enforcement, fire department. We all watched the videos and saw the response from the general Buffalo area turn up at the ship. This, this was a much uh, bigger response than when other museum ships have uh, suffered similar problems. So that's not a reason to be angry at them. Why didn't they have a plan and equipment in place ahead of time? They clearly did. Like I said, they immediately got all of the local responders from the Coast Guard, who are your top tier uh, ship savers, all the way down to their, their local first responders on scene as soon as they assessed that there was a problem. They had a plan, and they clearly went through it step by step and got everybody there, got the news out so that we all knew about it, and had accurate information relatively quickly. Like the, the, there was a plan that was enacted pretty quickly. Uh, the fact that the ship was already sunk by the time people showed up does not mean that they didn't have a plan. All right, so if they knew there was a leak, if they had a plan in place, why weren't watertight doors shut or why didn't watertight boundaries hold? Uh, so there, there's two reasons for this. The first thing is uh, even if watertight doors are secured, they're not watertight anymore. We did a video not too long ago where we chalk tested a door on the ship. Check that in the link in the description below. Uh, and that door would have been mostly watertight. Uh, it hasn't been maintained since 1991. But if that room flooded, the water would have escaped that room. Uh, the door wasn't perfectly watertight anymore. And all of us museum ships have these like, micro cracks around weld seams all around the ship from where water has sat over their active service lives. And since they're not maintained now as a museum ship, the water still gets around. Uh, Taney's big flood, which I got to witness firsthand, um, did not spread through the full ship. 
but it did go into places that had watertight doors closed because it was able to get through these cracks and just run freely from space to space as if the door had been open. Uh, so for example, flooding happened on second deck, but the water was able to run uh, not through the closed hatch to third deck where the museum's collection space was, but through uh, holes in the deck to get down there and flood out that space. Uh, and I am positive that the Sullivan's being open as a museum for even longer than Taney or New Jersey, uh, that is the case. Now that said, I'm betting money that the watertight doors weren't even closed. On Battleship New Jersey, we have all of our doors, all of them, everything we can access open. This is how the ship is preserved in mothballs for dehumidification so that the whole space is ventilated and you don't have condensation and uh, other stuff building up in closed off parts of the ship and causing corrosion. With all of the doors open, we're able to easily walk in and look, and it's ventilating so it is corroding less quickly. This does mean during a catastrophic incident, the flooding goes uh, through the whole ship if it's allowed to. And obviously what happened on the Sullivans is the absolute worst case scenario. You lose power for a long period of time overnight when no staff is there. Uh, with the ship open for tours, you're not opening and closing every single watertight door every day at the end of the day uh, and every morning when you come back on. And there was no indication that it was going to be a major issue when they left, so they didn't do anything special. Uh, in fact, many of New Jersey's doors are chained open so they would be difficult to close if we needed to. Guests coming on and messing with doors and closing things and whatnot, so we have to chain them open so that people aren't altering the tour route for the other guests. So it's even more difficult for us to set watertight conditions when we need to. Uh, we, we heard that they had to clean up about 4,000 gallons of water that uh, had oil in them. Why did the ship still have oil in our tanks? Um, believe it or not, the Navy puts these ships into mothballs with some of their oil in their tanks. New Jersey went into mothballs in 91 with 19% of her fuel capacity on board, uh, which is about a half a million gallons for us, uh, probably over about 60 different tanks. Most museum ships have that same thing. That is so that the Navy, when they're bringing the ship back, they could, in theory, light stuff off relatively quickly, uh, although I don't believe that's ever been done in practice, despite what the movie Battleship says. Uh, and uh, it is primarily so that the ship has ballast that's holding it to the right level, so it's not sitting high and gets blown around in the wind too much or might roll over. Uh, ships like New Jersey, and because I mentioned the movie Battleship Missouri also, had all of their residual fuel cleaned out. Um, most museum ships still have it on board. Now, it is a boon to your ship to clean it out, because it means that, uh, one, when something like this happens, there's no oil there. And two, if you have to do hot work on the outside of the ship, you can just do it. You don't have to clean the tank first. But it's impossible for most ships because it's frickin' expensive to call an outside contractor in to certify that the tank has air in it and then go in and clean all this stuff out. Um, it's just too expensive for most museum ships to maintain. Uh, so most of them still have some fuel in their tanks. Interestingly, uh, we heard a story from uh, another museum ship not too long ago that they had paid to get their tanks cleaned out. And as the temperatures changed and the ship's trim changed, more residual oil leaked out of some of the pipes and things and ran back into the tank, contaminating it again uh, meaning that they couldn't do hot work there like they had planned. So even if you spend the money to do it, doesn't necessarily mean that there's not still oil somewhere trapped in some pipe. Uh, Battleship New Jersey was only able to do it because the state gave the museum a tremendous amount of money on startup, uh, and that's primarily because we have the state's name, and the state was very involved in getting the ship and opening it. Uh, more so than they are nowadays, and they do not participate in operating the ship. 
uh, we are a private nonprofit. So it's very, very common, again, for these ships to have fuel in their tanks and for that to, to cause issues. Um, with funding from state or federal agencies, they might have been able to deal with that ahead of time. It's too bad they aren't giving much money to museum ships. Uh, the next question, why did the staff seem so passive during uh, the, the rescue operations when, when the ship was being saved? I'm not entirely sure where this one's coming from. Again, going back to the earlier bank of questions, uh, we are not ship drivers. We are museum professionals. Um, and it may have looked like they were passive because you had people like maritime contractors and the Coast Guard on scene to do all the dewatering. But I guarantee you that they were not passive and behind the scenes they were helping uh, with all of this, like helping coordinate things with blueprints of the ships and because th nobody knows the ships better than the museum staff. Uh, but they were not actively the ones diving on the ship or going into the flooded ship to dewater it. Uh, that's not their job. They were very active on the news, getting the word out, raising money, fundraising, that sort of stuff, uh, keeping us all informed so that uh, we all knew what was happening and could support them and they could get the money they needed to pay for these organizations and contractors to come in and do the actual work saving the ship. Uh, and I think that's something that Buffalo should be commended for doing. Having your ship sink is the worst possible thing that could happen to a museum ship. And they didn't like, oh, no, no, it's not sinking. It's just leaned over a little bit. Or we, we wanted to tilt her over so we could clean the underside there. So we just rolled the ship over to do that. No, no, no. They, they came out immediately and said what was happening and what they needed to make it better. And they were very communicative about what had happened, what went wrong. Uh, all of these things, and I, I think that was absolutely great, and that cannot have been easy to come out and, and say that the, the worst possible event had happened. Uh, so I, I really respect the guys up in Buffalo for how they handled the situation and what uh, they were doing, and uh, I, hope, I hope that you guys do too. Um, this really needs to be a judgment-free zone in which they give us all the information so that other museum ships can put into place things that uh, will prevent this from happening on us in the future. Most museum ships in this country are the same age, and most museum ships in this country have the same thickness of shell plating as uh, USS The Sullivans. The Sullivans has three-eighths mild steel shell plating around most of the hull, which is pretty common. On Battleship New Jersey, uh, our thinnest shell plating at the waterline is just one sixteenth of an inch thicker than that. We've long told people that sitting in fresh water, we're in good shape. And guess what? Buffalo is fresh water. The Sullivans has been sitting in fresh water for 60 years. Yeah, but Olympia hasn't had a catastrophic wrecking event recently. Somehow. <laughs> recently being the key word. So it, it is unfortunate that this happened to Buffalo. It was going to happen to someone eventually. It is critical at this point uh, that we all sit back and let Buffalo tell us what happened exactly and what lessons the rest of us can take from this so that we can prevent it going forward. Conclude this video. I think it's worth pointing out that uh, because of how the Sullivan situation was handled, we all heard about it. But that is far from the only museum ship to be in trouble uh, this year, and even in the month of April. So get this. Everybody heard that earlier this year, Clamagore shut down. Um, permanently after they discovered a leak and they're planning on disposing of the vessel probably by scrapping but it hasn't been fully determined yet. So uh, we, we've all heard that Clamagore's had issues for a while that uh, have only the beginning of this year sort of been announced that that's it, they're, they're going to uh, get rid of her one way or another. Uh, B-39, a Russian submarine in San Diego, was towed 
to be scrapped in Mexico in February. So there's another failed museum ship. Then in April, we have what happened on the Sullivans. Within a week, a Brazilian museum ship, uh, and I'm not going to try and pronounce the name, but there's a link in the description below to an article that uh, you can open up. It's written in Portuguese, but you can hit translate and, and read it. Uh, sank at her moorings. Within a week of that, the tugboat James Whelan sunk at her moorings. So there's three museum ships in April. By early May, another tugboat, Lake Superior, another museum ship, had sunk. So there are four ships within about a month that went down and six ships total this year that are no longer operating. If you look at the state of New Jersey, uh, the state of New Jersey has had three museum ships in their history. The battleship New Jersey is the newest one, uh, and we're the only one still afloat. The lightship Barnegat is a wreck over at the Pine Point Marina right here in Camden. She's been sitting in the mud for years now. Uh, no idea what's going to happen with her. They stripped some parts off of her to open in Barnegat, New Jersey, uh, but the ship is probably beyond saving. And of course, you guys have been following the saga of the submarine Ling, which also uh, sunk at her moorings in Hackensack a couple of years ago, uh, really predating all of this stuff that's happening right now. So all of our ships are a similar age, a similar hull thickness. This is happening to all of us right around the same time. Get out there and support your local museum ships. We don't receive federal funding. Uh, go online, check out their 990s, see if they're uh, above board, and think about going and volunteering or donating uh, so that we can preserve our ships now, preventive, preventative maintenance, rather than waiting for another Sullivan's incident. Because people didn't react when Barnegat sank or Ling uh, right away. With the Sullivan's, they did, and it looks like they're saving the ship. She's back afloat again, unlike many of these other ships that are still submerged. But if it happens to the next museum ship, or the one after that, or the one after that, is it going to get the same sort of national recognition? No. Eventually, we're going to get tired of this. So support your museum ships now so that we can save ourselves before what happened to the Sullivans happens to all of us. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate the support. There's a link in the description below. Uh, for ways you can donate to help us. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about the channel and our museum and the challenges facing all museum ships. Thanks for watching.